Gosh. I think it's getting cold today. Eh, 59 degrees isn't bad for California. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, I was recording a video devotion on a video, and uh, I was sitting over here. You can't see exit camera, right? Or left, depending on where you're looking. <laughs> and I was sitting up on the rail. Man, it was so cool. It was like reading from Tozer and talking about how God blesses you and uses you and how are people like, you know, Judas and compare Judas to Saul and how Judas was used by God at one time. You know, he was one of the 70 that God sent out, you know, to go and preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, raise the dead. And he did it. You know, but people forget that part. But it was neat because it was a, a teaching on the process of how God prepares you for ministry, equips you for ministry, gets you ready for ministry before you even think you're ready. You know, he takes you through a lot of experiences. And sometimes when you think you're already in the ministry, you're really not there yet until one day you are there. Great teaching. Wonderful. Not sure who it was for because I didn't record it. <laughs> I think it was for me. Ooh, it was cool. <laughs> Man, I got blessed. Sorry you missed out. <laughs> but uh, sometimes that happens with videos is that I go in to record it, click it, and it doesn't start recording. Oh, well. But the, the neat thing I enjoyed about that was that that's part of what God does in when you trust him in what he says, you do as he tells you to. You know, my my big shtick, so to speak, on recording these has always been the facts, the truth, and the reality of who we are. And in doing so, one of the things that Jesus said that we should do, and this is what teaches you to be prepared ahead of time, for ministry and why God takes such a long time to prepare you before he really sends you out into the ministry, so to speak, is that Jesus said that when they bring you up before magistrates and when they bring you before the people, you know, don't think about what you're going to say ahead of time. Because your Heavenly Father knows you have needed that before it ever happens, but don't think and prepare for when the time comes, the Holy Spirit will give you whatsoever he wants you to speak. And the beauty of it is that if you look in the book of Acts, you see that happening a lot. And it's some powerful words being said. Of course, the joy of having a personal relationship with God is that when it happens to you. Now, see, I have based my entire life on that premise. Of course, for me, it's not a premise. It's a fact. <laughs> And as a matter of fact, it's not just a fact, it's a history and a previous experience. Because when I go to share, whether speaking in a church or on video or anywhere, I don't know what you say. <laughs> I mean, Lord, it's your, it's your thing, you do it. You know, and I just kind of take a back seat and we go for it. You know? I had to smile about that because every time that God chooses to do that in me, I tell people, and I know they think that I'm an egotist or something, but I go, man, that was good, sometimes, because I get just as much out of watching it as maybe you do, because sometimes I turn around and I watch it and I go, wow, that's me? Whoa, <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> Boy, Lord, you did a good job. <laughs> and they think I'm kidding. I mean, talk to my wife. <laughs> now, it's true that, you know, I talk to my wife a lot. Helps. <laughs> and uh, she'll tell you that, yes, that I, what you see is what you get. You know, I really do talk a lot about Jesus. You know, and I'm constantly 
mindful of everything in context of a personal relationship with God. And the fact that God is involved in interposing himself in all activities of my life and her life. And so, you know, she's kind of had to deal with that, <laughs> you know, since we've been married. But, um, well, but I know a lot of people don't do that. And so I try to be as honest on these videos as I can be and to take different shots and visages so that people would recognize that you, as you are, the way you are, is what God did. You are God's workmanship created for good works in Christ Jesus. You are the work of His hands. He is a craftsman and He's working on you and He's working in you. He will work through you and He will work with you. Because you see, He's not only your rear word guard, it's in the King James, He's not looking at your rear, He's your guard. He's not just your forward, He's not just your word. <laughs> you thought I was going to say word, didn't you? <laughs> not me, man. I ain't dumb. <laughs> but he's got you covered in all ways and inside and out. So that he is with you always, in all ways. And because he is, the way you are is his accomplishment. Did you ever think that you are God's accomplishment? Amazing, isn't it? When you look at it that way. Of course, if you're his failure, I think he needs to work on you a little more. But God is at work both to do and to will of his good pleasure, so he's trying to accomplish something with you when you participate with him. If you don't participate with him, then he's working on you. When you participate with him, then he's working in you. When you resist him, then he's working around you. <laughs> and he will cover you as long as you stay under his covering, if you're resisting him. But when you decide to go outside of his covering, doing things you shouldn't do, that he said he would not protect you in, then you kind of got to suffer the consequences of your own actions, dude. You did it. It's your ball game. You got to pick it up, take it back to God and say, whoops, could you fix this mess? I boo-booed. You do that a lot. But once you move into ministry, you realize that irregardless of what you say, and my wife hates this, but God will make it work to his glory in some way. And what does I hate to say about some of the pastors out there that you know, kind of we don't all get along with, but he will use them in their way to accomplish his own glory. Not ours, not yours, not mine, not what we want, not what we expect, but what he wants. So you see, sometimes when we're trying to fix someone of what they seem like is wrong, Maybe the fix isn't meant for them at that moment in time. Maybe fixing them hinders them. Maybe they just aren't ready. So how do we know the difference? Well, bluntly, I think we would ask someone who knows. I know for myself, whenever I was on a job, and I've had lots of jobs, I probably have more jobs than anybody you know. <laughs> but whenever I was on a job, and the reason why I've had lots of jobs because I get bored and I want to do something else, try something else, go experience something else and figure out, hey, could I do that? I wonder if I could do that. Let's go check it out, Lord. Go try. But whenever I went on to another job, I would see who was doing it the best. And then I'd see if I could improve it. And then I would watch how they did it and I go, oh, that's pretty cool. And then I'm always coming up with new ideas, so I always try to invent some kind of better way. And I usually did. And I was able to do things quickly, fast, assimilate them, make them positive, part of my capabilities, and then move onward from it. And I'd always get promoted up the ladders fast and whatever. You know, and it was fun. You know, I enjoyed it. 
But God always had something else in store and in mind. But the point being is that you learn from who you know knows what they're talking about. You don't go listen to someone who doesn't know what they're talking about because, frankly, you'll probably get wrapped up in what they're doing because they usually... A person who doesn't know what they're talking about usually wants you to come along with them. They always want some kind of following because they're insecure, so they need security in numbers. But the person who knows what he's doing usually doesn't want you around. As a matter of fact, they'll kind of tell you to go do something else so that they can get the job done while you're busy doing some other menial job. So you kind of just watch over your shoulder and see how fast that guy gets it done, that craftsman, and then you just do what he did. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> you come and ask me to help me, and I'll probably send you off to go do something else. Not anymore, because the Lord doesn't let me, but in the old days, I used to say, well, could you please get out of my way, because I could do it faster without you, quicker, easier, and get it done. And when the job done was the purpose, then yes, I was very good at it. But learning to cooperatively work in a team was fun because then you have a different purpose in mind. You're trying to bring out the abilities of others. So that's the goal, not to get the job done. So in different times of my life, I've worked in different ways. God isn't trying to get a job done when it comes to your life. He doesn't want you to Say, well, God, what do you want me to do today? And then you run out and go do it. What he wants to do is bring out an accomplishment in you that you are his workmanship. You are the end result. So as you go along imperfect, you are being made perfect by your imperfect way of trying to do what he says or what he is working on you in. So today you might be going through some kind of trial or tribulation or... You know, frustration, and all he's trying to get you to do in the whole situation of that trial, tribulation, situation, circumstance, aggravation, is to rejoice. So, you don't know why, you don't know what, you don't know where, you don't know how, you don't know who. So you're trying to figure out what to do, and you're going, man, Lord, you know, I've been, I've been working at this, and working at this, and I just can't get it done. And God's giving you some kind of ridiculous statement, you know, every time you ask him, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he goes, rejoice. And you're going, nah, that won't get the job done. I don't want to rejoice. I want to get the job done. And God goes, rejoice. And you're going, no, Lord, you don't get it. I got a job to do. I want to get the job done. And telling me to rejoice isn't going to get my work done. I'm sorry. It just doesn't work that way. God says, okay. And he leads you to your will. And your will says, I'm going to do it my way. But you don't know that his will for the day was to teach you one thing. And it wasn't to get the job done, but it was for the job to be done on you, which was to cause you to come to the knowledge of doing what he says is more important than accomplishing what you think he wants you to do. You kind of get it. All he wanted you to do was rejoice. So all the circumstances came up of not rejoicing so that you would be either obedient and do it, and maybe overcome it, or be bur buried in it. And so by the end of the day, you're kind of burned out, frustrated, and it's like, oh, Wednesday's hump day. No, it's not. Every day's the same. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, you mean that's all I got to do every day? Well, that's one of the things. <laughs> there is a list, but, you know, it's pretty simple. Rejoicing will get you through the list. Oh, so it's not like, thank God it's Friday, or hang on till Sunday's coming, or Manic Monday, or Terrible Tuesday, Wednesday's Child is Far to Go, or something like that? No, it's not. It's every day the Lord is made, and every day we're called to rejoice in it. When we let God speak, and let God do what He wants to do, we become his workmanship, his craftsmanship, we are the work he is trying to accomplish. It's not going out there and trying to build a mansion in the sky or temples or monasteries or whatever you're building. And Keith Green had a hard time with that because he finally wrote a song about it that it's called Until Your Love Broke Through that he said, 
Like a foolish builder trying to build a highway to the sky, all my hopes would come tumbling down and I never knew just why until you took me by surprise. It's like waking up out of the longest dream, how real it seemed until your love broke through. Because you see, Keith Green really wanted to make a righteousness, a highway, this righteous highway of doing that we would all get there and we would all be oh so holy and so wonderful and so pure going there. <laughs> He's pretty tough on it. But when the love overwhelmed him, he realized, you know, sometimes the weakest of links is what God is all about. Because the strongest doesn't need God, but the weakest does. So really, the weakest link is the strongest because it has a dependency on God. <laughs> it's really reverse of everything in the world, which, frankly, if you just kind of go out there and get one of those uh, motivational speakers, you know, and kind of get some of those business management people together and write down what they have to say, all you got to do is the opposite of what they just said. Man, you're right with God. <laughs> I know some of you aren't going to agree with me, but we could discuss it some other time. I'll bet you I'm right. Oh well. Make his praise glorious. This people have I formed for myself. They show forth my praise. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against, transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth. That is you. But you notice who's doing it. I will pardon all their iniquities. I will cleanse them from all their iniquities. I will pardon all their sins where they have sinned and their transgressions against me. You see, your sin isn't against all these other things, but really is against... God. So if God forgive you, what are you worried about? <laughs> By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Wait a minute. I know he's forgiven to me, so I can thank him for that. And I know he's working on me so I can thank him for that, but you mean I gotta thank him in the midst of what I'm going through? And, and that other part, rejoice too? But, 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 I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. And what are thy works? You are. <laughs> Great are you, O oh Lord, and you have made him your work and not mine. <laughs> it's all yours, God. But great are thy works, O oh God, that you have accomplished for us, unto us, in us, your salvation. For great is thy mercy towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, your son died for us. So the work of God is not what to do, but what he's doing because of what God has done. <laughs> and what has God done? He saved you. Now he's fixing you. Now he's making you into the express image of his son. Perfect. Hmm. Sounds a little complicated. Not for God. Maybe for us to understand it. But if you kind of run the tape over and over and over again, you know, enough times, maybe it'll make sense, maybe it won't. Maybe you won't even bother to watch it the first time. Cool! You know? But recognize at least one thing. 
God's work is you. He is always able to do and accomplish good. For when he created the universe, and when he created the heavens, and when he created earth, and when he created man in his image, he saw, and it was good.